want to start a bit different maybe than, than some of the others. I want to start off with saying like, guys, what is this a special day? This, this room is filled with people, you're all students. Um, you're very smart because otherwise you wouldn't be studying here. And you're thinking to become an entrepreneur, otherwise you wouldn't be in this room, right? Right or not? Who thinks about becoming an entrepreneur? Well, okay, that's quite a fair share. Um, I think if you if you dig a bit deeper, what's what's important to know? I think in the end it is that your persistence, your drive, your energy, your ideas, that is what will become the next Google, the next Shell, the next TomTom. Yeah. <laughs> think about that. Think about Google today. It's a huge company started somewhere in the shed. And it's with every company in the world like that. Every company starts from something. Um, and you guys are thinking about establishing a new business, about bringing to market a new idea, about developing a technology which in the end becomes a product. Um, that's very special. Okay, who am I? Um, I'm the CEO of Fastnet, I'm Phil Langezaal, and this is what, what my company does. We, we build charging stations along the highway in the Netherlands. Um, it's basically yeah, like a gas station. It's a location along the highway where you stop with your car, you put the plug in the car instead of using gasoline with the hose. You put a plug in your car now, you press start, and 20 minutes later, today it takes about 20 minutes, you can drive off again. Um, and before I did this, I, um, I worked at a company uh, called Appion. It was a TU Delft startup, um, also well known at Yes Delft. Um, and what did we do there? Well, we produced chargers. We produced this, this piece of equipment, or actually two, that are standing there. It's basically yeah, just like a, like a gas pump, only then, then different. It does electricity. And I think for me, both, both of these companies are an experience I'd like to talk to you about today. Um, Epion was, I think, a great success. If, if, you, if you think about it, uh, when, I, when I joined Epion, there were about 20, 30 well, sort of students, and they, they were hiring people, business people, to get this company off to the market. They had an idea, they had a technology, and they, um, they thought, we need to get that to market. And they did. Uh, about three years later, they sold it off to AVB. And why? Because they did it better than the large corporations. They were smarter, they were faster. This group of people was a great team. <coughs> when, um, when Yes Delft came to me a few weeks ago, and they, uh, they asked me, can you tell me something, uh, can you tell me something to this group of students? I asked them, like, what should I tell? Well, in the end, you're all students, and you think about being an entrepreneur. And then, what what can you learn from? Well, you need maybe a few lessons. So what I try to do is I try to dissolve. I try to do basically to conclude some of the lessons I've learned in the last eight years from working at a startup, having my own startup, uh, and working in corporate life. Um, and and one of the lessons I like to start with is. Get yourself a team. Um, when, I, when I graduated uh, from, from university here, I was working on a research thing with automotive stuff, um, uh, friction and pressing body panels, quite complicated and very boring. Uh, and people said to me, like, do you want to do research? Do you want to continue this? It's a very good idea. And I was like, no, of course not. I'm, I have now been sitting six months behind my computer on my own. Fuck it, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I want, I want to work with people. It should be fun. Um, so I started to do something else. I joined a consultant company and, uh, and, and started to do a lot of consulting in the automotive industry, which I liked quite a lot. Um, and um, then I saw, uh, in 2009, I saw the Tesla Roadster coming by. First, quite serious electric car. Um, and um, I thought, shit, this, this is going to disrupt the industry. This is very cool. I need, I need to get in. I need to get this 
in this industry. This, is, this will grow very happily. And then I was like, shit, but I'm again alone. What did I do wrong? I need, I need to find people. And that's, that's, for me, that's one of the key things I like, to, I like to tell you about. You're probably here, maybe you have an idea, maybe not. Maybe the person next to you has an idea, but doesn't know how to execute it. In the end, you need a team. And why do you need a team? Because you're alone is, is alone. And you will, you will find obstacles in, in building that company, in getting that, that startup off the ground. And how do you tackle obstacles? Well, of course, you do that by taking actions and, and finding solutions. But one thing is a very social thing. You need someone to hold on to when it, when it gets rough. You need to be able to go to the bar on Friday Eve and grab a drink together and say, fuck, shit, this was a heavy week. <laughs> um, and you can only do that with a team. Only a team can, can make you stronger. Um, let, me, let me tell you a bit about the team that, that, um, that I found when, um, when I left that consulting job. Um, what I did is um, I, started, I seriously started looking around for companies who invested in something with electric vehicles. So I found a company in, in, in Delft called Capiol. They just got an investment from an investment vehicle uh, and they made fast chargers for electric cars. Well, that's a cool product that probably does something with electric cars. And, ah, yeah, shit, electric cars don't have much range, so that makes sense. Hey, uh, good idea, good idea. Maybe I should join them. And then I, whoa, okay. Um, then again, I was thinking, uh, okay, but yeah. Then I'm not an entrepreneur because I'm, I'm, I'm joining a company. Boring, hmm. maybe not that of a good idea. Um, and I started talking to them in the end because I, I was so fascinated about their technology and I found it was an amazing team. It was a very, very cool team. They had a great, great founder called Kein Baumann, uh, TU Delft student as well. Uh, and he had a, had a very good vision, a good strategy. Um, was maybe a bit young at the time and, uh, and, and had not, that, not seen that many corporates to have a bit of an idea on how to run a company. But he was very good at the ideas and knew the technology. And he had a good, good group of people around him. And together with that group, they were quite smart. They hired people who already did it. They already had brought a few startups to market. Old Philips guys, uh, and they were quite successful. And that team was around 40 people. Um, 2010, and I joined that team. It was great. We had a team, and we accomplished many, many great things. We sold 100 charges in the first year. We had alliances with BMW, Mercedes, etc. And, and they seriously thought it. Well, okay, in the beginning, when we first met them, they were like, "Fuck you, you're like a tiny company from Delft. Delft, that's somewhere in the Netherlands. You don't have an automotive industry. You can't make chargers." Well, this company today, Appium, uh, has been bought by ABB. This company is the world's largest manufacturer of fast chargers. They, have, they work with practically any automaker in the world. They are active on three continents. Who did that? That did that team of 50 people. Why? Because I had a crazy salesman, Johan Peters. This guy, he sold anything. He would sell his own company if he would be a director of the company. <laughs> Seriously. He, there are so many, many stories you can tell about him. Um, but he was a great salesman, but he couldn't, do it, he couldn't do anything else than selling. And then you have like the financial guy, Stefan Franco. Well, the finance things of, of startups, it's, I can tell you, finance is a large issue. You need money to get stuff going. And if stuff is not in good order, investors won't like it. So you need a very good person to do your finance. Again, you need a team. Well, then another lesson, uh, another lesson I'd like to uh, like to give you along is many of you think in this room probably it's all about that idea. A lot of people talk about patterns and say, well, think about the tie rip. Uh, it's just a small thing, very smart idea, and, and I can become rich, and, and I have a great company. It's all about that idea. Well, mm, not really. Sorry. Sorry, it doesn't work like that. It's 
partly the idea and, and maybe 80% its execution. When we started Appion, I think probably there were around, around the globe, I think maybe 100 companies, or at least 30 serious companies building, producing, developing chargers for electric cars that, be, that were fast, should be made in volume, were to market. 30 companies worldwide, quite something. Why did we win? Because we did it better. Um, and I think, I think the same holds true for Fastnet. Today there are many, many companies in Europe that are working on uh, putting down, uh, operating, investing in, in some sort of infrastructure for electric cars. Some put down uh, slow charging poles in cities. Some do it at restaurants. And all have different business models. And one thing of it is execution. You need a great team and you need that execution power to get it done. You don't want to have customers that are unhappy. You should make them happy. You want to keep investors happy. So you need to show them that you're not just throwing out money for no reason. It's all execution there. Um, another lesson which comes close to ideas as well. Who of you has seen the movie Flash of a Genius? Maybe the name doesn't say that much. Um, I used to see it as a kid. <laughs> it's about an, uh, about an inventor who, um, yeah, years ago, invents an uh, intermittent uh, windshield wiper for a car um, and talks about his idea to the Ford Motor Company. And a few months later, he sees it on a car on a motor show. The first windshield wiper that works intermittent. And he says, shit, you stole my idea. And he starts suing them for a long time and uh, in the end, they offer him a deal that they say, well, I'll give you 30 million and then please shut up. And um, he says, no, I want you to, to, to tell the world that was my idea. And they said, fuck you. And in the end, his family broke up and, well, nobody ever, that was sort of like the story. But <laughs> um, I, think, I think the important thing is that I think there are a lot of students that think like that. It's my idea. Hmm, shit, hmm. People can copy it, but well, I think in real world, it's really the opposite. Um, share your idea with as many people as you can. Because why? Smart people, they will have listened to the story and they will think, shit, but I need a team. So what do they do? If they don't have anything to do, if they like you, they will join you. Share your idea. Why? Because they will join you. What do the dumb people do? Well, the dumb people, they will either not understand your great idea, so they will just think, oh, fuck her off, whatever, or they will try to copy it, but they're dumb, so they can't copy it correctly, so it won't work. <laughs> think about it, think about it, how important it is. You need a team. How do you get that team? By sharing your idea to others. So if you don't share, you don't get a team. And a team is needed for execution. Is that clear? Um, let me tell you also a story about, about a team. Um, a while ago I told you that I said, well, I want to be an entrepreneur. And maybe joining Epion, a startup which is already growing, that doesn't make me an entrepreneur. And what happens if you're in entrepreneur land, if you're in entrepreneur land, everyone thinks like that. It's very entrepreneurial. Everyone wants to do new things. And when I was working at this company, we were talking to many utilities. So all the electric uh, yeah, companies selling electricity, well, everyone said, well, they will, they will put down the charging infrastructure for electric cars. That will happen. No worries. So we, we talked to them, made business cases, and in the end I got quite frustrated because I thought they were idiots, they didn't understand the business, and they were bored anyhow, and they were boring people from large corporations that we just talked about. They all did the same, and they didn't really listen, and well, they had money anyway. Um, 
and I met someone else, uh, one of the investors in, in, in Appiel. And the funny thing was he was, he was studying history, uh, or he, sorry, he studied history, and he said, I have seriously no clue what this company is about if I ra walk around here, because you're talking about volts, amperes, uh, power electronics, transformers, I have no clue what that is all about, but why I invested, because I think fast charging makes sense. I want to drive my car, and if I want to drive it, then I need to be able to charge it very quickly. Okay, clear. And what did he do? In the, in the non-executive board meetings, he was constantly bugging off people by saying like, ah, well, we should now also start to put down charges in cities and so, and, and, and people said, okay, well, talk to Michiel, because you guys probably, you need, to, you need to talk to each other. And that happened. Again, meeting up people, sharing ideas. And this was Bart Lovers, my current, current companion in, in Fastnet. And Bart had, I think, five years, ten years before that, he worked on the startup Metro in the Netherlands. So he put down Metro, the free newspaper, most of you probably know. Uh, he put that, uh, put that up in the Netherlands. And he said, the core thing about Metro was location, location, location. That was the idea. That's what's the idea behind Fastnet. Location, location, location. You need to have locations, otherwise you can't sell electricity. It's a retail business. And no one of the utilities understood that. They thought that electricity, you sell that to people that are a number on an invoice. Because that's what they were used to. They didn't know their customer, it was an invoice. How did we come to the idea? Because we were there together, we met, and in the end we found it Fastnet a few months later. Well, another, another lesson. Um, um, lesson four. Um, I was in, in Shenzhen in China uh, in 2010. Um, I think we had produced our charger number 10 or 12 or so. And we were there quite, yeah, we were quite happy with the company, we were accelerating and we were quite happy with our product. And then we were running around in China on, an, on a fair, EVS, it's the lar yeah, largest electric vehicle fair in the world, it was held in Shenzhen, close to Hong Kong, uh, in that year. And um, we saw what, what was happening there. I think when basically this hall was filled with cars, power electronics, batteries and, and, and it just scared the shit out of us. We were like, shit, are they gonna, are they gonna overtake us? Uh, when we will see, you know, when is it that we will see these chargers arriving in the Netherlands? Can we even compete with that? <coughs> and it wasn't a few weeks later that, that the, um, uh, the board meeting within Appion uh, was discussing how can we compete with China? Um, and well, it's now about three years later, and there are no chargers from China in the Netherlands. Don't underestimate the power of knowledge. Um, if you're in your startup three years in the industry, and it's a very young industry, you're probably one of the few people that know in the world, that know about that industry, that know it deeply. I think in the Netherlands currently, there are maybe five to six people, which I can think of being a serious, um, expert in e-mobility. Most of them talk bullshit, but there are around six that really know the topic. And worldwide, maybe a hundred, maybe two hundred. A lot of them are learning, but only a few of them have more experience than four to five years. Um, and that will probably, for Nerdalize, it will be the same for, for other companies. Many startups have people that, that are just, they're one of the first people that know that industry. And that is of great value. Think about that. Okay, and then the last lesson, lesson five. Think different for a reason. Um, if, you, if you want to be in a corporate, uh, a corporate environment is great for having all the same thoughts. Why? Because it's a big oil tanker and it's 
just continuously going in the same direction, no changes. Um, there's no development, it doesn't change. But if you want to build that startup um, and you want to be successful, you need to think different than other, than other companies and than other markets. You need to do something new. Um, I will tell you a story about Fastnet. Um, it was in the, in the summer of 2013, uh, last year, and we were discussing, we just had the first station built. We were quite happy with it, um, and, uh, and money, money was going out quite rapidly. Uh, we were building stations, each station cost around 200,000 euros. Um, so if you built every other week a station, you easily spent a million euros a month, and revenues don't go in that quickly. Um, and we were discussing, okay, how, how do we fund our future build? How do we do that? How do we fund it? And if you become an entrepreneur, most people will tell you, then you go to venture capital firms. And once in a while you hear people saying, well, then you should crowdfund it. But then you also can, if you dig deeper, then you hear, well, crowdfunding that's capped in the Netherlands at two and a half million euros. Um, after that, you need a, uh, a permit and a vergunning. You need a, a permit from the authority financial markets. Why? Because you're basically going to a retail product for the stock exchange. Um, so you don't have that many options. And, and how do you do that? You go talking to venture capitalist firms, and these firms, they will offer you money, and they will take half your company away from you, and they will tell you how to do it. Um, how do you do that? And, and, and you think differently, so they probably won't understand you. Think about it, you have a new product, a new idea, and these investors, yeah, they will think along, of course, but how long will it take them to understand your new idea? It can take six months, maybe even longer. Quite a challenge. Um, and we were discussing this idea, Bart and me, and um, we said, well, um, how do we do that? How, how, how are we going to tackle this issue? Um, and many of the uh, advisors, they said, well, do it the normal way. Make a presentation and, um, and uh, yeah, go to venture capital firms, just invite 50 of them, and one will buy it. Okay? And what do we do then? One will buy it, and then we have maybe 3 million, but we need 40 million for the Netherlands. So we need to continue a continuous line of people coming in. This will be a shitload of work. Um, and Bart then said, well, but can we, not, can we not use that crowdfunding idea? Because there are so many people that I meet every other day, our current customers. They just have bought their electric car and they really want this infrastructure. That's why we're doing it. That's why we're building a network of charging stations. Because these people want freedom. And what I said then is, well, let's, let's not gamble on one, one horse. Let's do it differently. Let's, let's do both ways. So let's talk to venture capital firms and let's, let's have a look whether we can do it with crowdfunding. Um, and then we said, well, let's, let's, let's look a bit further. Why would crowdfunding stop at 2.5 million euros? Um, and, um, we started talking to a person that knew about getting large audiences together um, to, uh, to fund windmills in the Netherlands, wind centrale. Uh, this guy had just funded 6 million euros for a number of windmills. And he had experience with um, getting such a permit from the authority financial markets. What happened in six months, this person joined Fastnet, again, team, and he wrote the entire permit application, a booklet, a prospectus, of about 100 pages, containing everything needed. And on June, uh, July the 7th this year, we went to a small company stock exchange. And then people say after a week, well, but you haven't sold all the shares. Well, we only, only got in one and a half million euros. Not that much yeah, true. Um, of course, we hope for a lot more, but it's growing currently at a pace of 100% per month. It's growing rapidly. 
We had a first start, then a dip, and after it, it's growing. We're selling a lot of shares. We're funding our company in this way. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna close off. Um, I think the moral of the story is um, take a few lessons along. Startuping is a lot of fun. It's great fun. And make sure you've got a team, because that team will drive you anywhere. Um, and as discussed earlier, with the cars, the planes, and the trains, um, if, you're, if you're driving a car, the thing of transport is that you, you think of transport being a car. If you're in that train, everyone around you sits in the train as well. Um, but if you're in a plane, starting up, taking off that runway, um, well, you end up at a new airport and, and maybe another plane takes off. That's what happened to me. I was in one of those startups and I joined another startup. I actually started it myself. And when I, when I started Fastnet, uh, I asked my, my boss at that time, uh, Hans Streng, um, at Appion, I, I asked, Hans, what do you think of this? Is this, a, is this? is it a great challenge? Yeah, of course. He said, yeah, man, cool, very cool idea, go on. And I said, what happens if it fails? And he said, well, then you come back because I like you and you're a great person. And you come to work for me. And then a year later, when the company was quite successful, we were building stations, money was coming in. Um, I said to him, well, this is, this is just a once in a lifetime story that I'm going to tell today. This is so cool. We're opening our first network of stations. This is, this is never going to happen to me again. And he said, well, yeah, I thought that but the first startup and the second, and yeah, well, hmm, no, it will happen again and again. Think about that. Thank you. So why would they charge the car the highway and not their home? <laughs> yeah, well, today you can you can charge your car at home by just putting it in a wall plug, but it takes around eight to ten hours. Um, and if the battery goes bigger, then it takes like the bigger if the battery goes two times the size, then the charging takes two times uh, the time as well, so it takes twenty hours. Uh, by putting down special equipment, you can keep the charging time the same. That's one thing. Secondly, How fast can you charge a car with fast net station? Yeah, it's around currently around 20 minutes, but we see that time decreasing. We see power going up, so with that bigger batteries. With this, yeah, okay, you need to buy, of course, new equipment. But then again, if you have good locations, a lot of customers coming, then it's also a good investment to increase the power. Yeah. It's a small stage. And in the end, you need to have it for freedom. Uh, if you want to drive around your house, yeah, that's fine, but then. You want to drive beyond that. People buy cars because they are freedom. And I know a lot of car companies are selling electric cars with fast chargers. Tesla does that. Is that a good car? Is that a good car? Is that a good car? So some car companies are selling a charger with their car. Uh, I think what you mean is that Tesla um, sells their car, including a subscription to their own stations. So that's sort of a network of flagship stores. I think you have two, uh, three charging stations down in the Netherlands, and you can charge there for free. They call it supercharging. I think it's very good. The problem of electric car today is that you can't drive anywhere. Why? Because there are no charging stations. So it's very good that they help with our extra locations. They are also expanding the market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. More question over here. Um, you just told us uh, July 2013 was your first station, I believe, in about yeah. oh, no, over a year ago there were five stations. Yeah. Uh, back regarding the expansion of that. I think, I think there are two things. BMW very much likes the fact that there is more infrastructure because what's the main problem of their product is that there is no infrastructure. So that's, that's one thing. So they will be, always be very positive and they will always tell you as well electricity doesn't cost anything. This that helps. So it, there's always a bit of exaggeration there. That's one point. 
Um, my learning is, and that's, that's the product that we're in, um, building stations along the highway in any country. Uh, we live in a world with a lot of people, so space is limited, etc., etc. And what did we do with that? All. We have a government and we have permits. Um, and to build such a thing, you need to have permits. You need to have permits signed by a municipality, in this case because they're along the highway, uh, by the Ministry of Infrastructure of the Netherlands. And it basically means a lot of bureaucracy. It basically means that you have a lot of time convincing people. And in the end we found out that it can take a year, a year and a half, anything to five years to, to tackle bureaucracy. Two, two more questions. One over here. No, no, forget it. Getting help from the government? <laughs> no, don't, don't think about that as an entrepreneur. You're not getting help. You need to have that team. They will help you. Question there? Yes, for regarding that team, uh, when you start to see what kind of people do you usually want? So, what kind of people do you want on your team? Uh, um, it depends a bit on the type of business. I think that's, that's part of it. But you can, I think you can think very much of of a corporation in that sense, what kind of functions do you need there? So a normal, a normal company has some, someone focused on finance. Uh, in case you're selling a product, you need someone in sales. So you need to think of, think of it very simple. Think in activities. What kind of activities are we going to do as a company in the coming six months? And you will grow your business, and in that sense you will grow your organization. And that's also, in the end, the main challenge of a startup. Most startups fail, not because their idea is bad, but they fail in execution. And execution, a part of it, is going through those growth pains. Um, as a founder, I find, it's, it's just another story, I find it very difficult at some point in time to let loose some things. I was quite used to the fact that we had a server in the, in the office and I used to do the maintenance. Why? Because I, yeah, somebody needed to do it, so I did it. And in January this year, I found out I just don't have the time anymore. People come to me and say, I, that my computer doesn't work. And I'm like, shit, but I don't have the time to fix it. So in the end, you hire someone to do it. And we did. And I think you need to think of that. I think one of the core skills of a CEO of a startup is allowing those growth pains to be outspoken in the company and to discuss who should we put on that. Growing that organization is very, very important. Well, for now, I think we'll keep it there because we want to invite the other two as well. But first, a big round of applause for you. Thank you very much.